Um, hello, everyone. My name is Natalia Andrichuk, and I'm a statistical data scientist at the R Center of Excellence at Pfizer. And uh, today I'm going to tell you about the R Center of Excellence um, journey and the adoption of R at Pfizer. And we will discuss the R community and what it takes to build sustainable and engaging R community. And I want to start to um, my talk saying that last year I presented at PositConf where I had a chance to give a presentation about building our community um, and the community of our users at Pfizer. And it was like a 20 minute talk. So today I have a chance to expand on a few key points that I provided back then and provide more information regarding the certain initiatives we run. So let's begin with answering the question of why we are on the R adoption journey at Pfizer and why we need to build the community of R users. Uh, here's my favorite quote from Alice in Wonderland. My dear, here we must run as fast as we can just to stay in place. And if you wish to go anywhere, you must run twice as fast as that. And in my opinion, this perfectly describes what's happening in pharma world when it comes to adoption of R. Pharma companies are quickly adopting R, and there are numerous seminars and presentations about R adoption through like R consortium, like this one. And if you've been to professional conferences related to R in the past few years or programming and pharma, you've seen a lot of those R adoption uh, presentations. So for instance, the talk you see on the slide given by Mike K. Smith was presented at PositCon last year as well. So R adoption is a hot topic in the pharma world. Adopting new language within the organization is hard, especially if you have hundreds of programmers sitting in different parts of your organization from supply chain to bioinformatics. And on top of that, they're all in different places when it comes to their R journey. So some of them can be, might be beginners, some of them are experts and like everyone in between. And colleagues also have different motivation and different resources for learning R. Therefore, building the community, connecting people and their experience, experiences, providing resources becomes vital for success of the R adoption and community building. But where do we start? This is such a big undertaking. Um, when something happens fast and something is very new, you need to have a good structure in place to accomplish it. So you want to give people appropriate tools to build their expertise and connect them with each other. In 1943, the Psychological Review Journal published a paper called A Theory of Human Motivation. The author of this paper was Abraham Maslow. This was the paper where he proposed the idea that received the name of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. According to his theory, human needs are arranged in hierarchy with the physiological survival needs on the bottom and more creative and intellectually, intellectually oriented self-actualization needs at the top. So Maslow argued that the survival needs must be satisfied before individual can satisfy the higher level needs. Although Maslow never himself created the pyramid to represent the hierarchy of needs, the pyramid became the most popular way to illustrate the proposed idea because we humans tend to illustrate hierarchies in the shape of the pyramid. Um, here on the slide, you see the pyramid that consists of the layers, otherwise needs, starting from the most basic lower level needs like food and water and safety, progressing to other psychological and self-fulfillment needs. Maslow's idea suggested the most basic level of needs must be met before individual will strongly desire to focus motivation upon the, the secondary or higher level needs. Similarly, when approaching building the community and internalizing new programming language, we need to identify the R adoption and community building hierarchy of needs within the organization. There are certain needs that must be met first uh, that are vital before we can move on to higher level ones. Having the hierarchy in the form of the pyramid is also great representation, since it shows that it is important to have a strong foundation if you wanna to get to the top. So during this presentation, I'm going to share with you the R adoption and community building hierarchy of needs that we identify and currently fulfilling at Pfizer. 
So knowing the needs of your community is very important because it help it helps um, to establish proper initiatives to fulfill these needs. But before we jump in into describing the initiatives we established, I need to go back in time and tell you about what made it possible. In 2022, Mike K. Smith and Douglas Robinson took on the initiative of creating and assembling the R Center of Excellence Advisor, the center that would coordinate our strategy across business lines within Pfizer. The idea was the following. The RCOE was going to be comprised of two teams, our core team and our SWAT team. And these teams would work together to accomplish the R-centric goals within organization. The R core team would ensure cross-functional representation. And the SWAT team is going to be the R-centric group dedicated resource uh, with dedicated resource and strong technical skills. So let's look at these groups more closely. Our core team manages a set of initiative streams within the company that build culture and strategy around R. Here are the set of the initiative streams that um, we defined for the R core team to run. The team takes care of the internal outreach and builds the internal community initiatives. It identifies opportunity for new training material and curates internal training. It adopts processes, ways of working, automation, anything new. And then it also distributes information about advances in R through newsletters and keeps community updated on the new technologies or new R packages. It builds communication channels. It also influences the external environment through cross pharma initiatives like R Consortium, R and Pharma, Fuse, and et cetera. And the core team also helps the SWAT team to prioritize and identify consultancy opportunities. The SWAT team members uh, take part in the R core team initiatives the, and lead some of them. But what is the SWAT team? Our SWAT team acronym stands for the Scientific Workflows and Analytic Tools. We are the internal consultancy group within Pfizer, and we are the R experts for groups that don't have their own R experts within their departments. And we're also professional community builders. The SWAT team consists of six, six people you see on the photo led by Mike K. Smith. And community building and R adoption is not our side project. It is one of our priorities. We're focused on our projects specifically, and we also have community building and our adoption initiatives in our goals for each semester. And we treat those as project deliverables. And at the end of the semester, we're accountable for the outcome. The R SWAT team also has uh, its own objectives. We provide technical input to experts and training help for beginners. We help developers to go from code that uh, works to the code that is sustainable for the long term, avoiding and reducing the technical debt, potential technical debt, I would say. Uh, we provide strategic solutions to various problems across the organization uh, that can or should be solved with R. And we also connect colleagues uh, who are looking for a solution to a particular problems with those who already solved it, uh, which streamlines the pro uh, problem solving and reduces the duplicate work. And since its establishment in 2022, the RCOE has come a long way and we tackled a lot of goals and established initiatives that fit our, our community and our adoption hierarchy of needs. We worked tirelessly to fulfill every layer of that pyramid and um, with our initiatives, and we're continuing to do so. So without further, further ado, let's climb this pyramid together, and I'll show you the way. And we start with tier one. So in Maslow's theory, psychological needs are the base of the hierarchy. So food, water, sleep, shelter. So the needs that have to be fulfilled for us humans to survive. And in the our adoption and community building terms, 
fundamental needs translate into having proper IT infrastructure and support, because this is the fundamental need of our users. Having infrastructure and IT support is very critical. It is a foundation for all our projects. At Pfizer, we use Docker containers and suite of professional posit tools for our R projects, and our IT department support, supports all of them. Our IT colleagues ensure that all these tools work properly and work together. Um, we use Docker containers and posit package manager to ensure reproducibility of results in, produ in production environment. Um, our colleagues have access to various containers that are well tested. And each Docker container has specific version of R along with define R packages and their specific versions. So once released, the Docker container stays, uh, stays unchanged, which ensures that the program uh, developed using it will run in a year, in two or five, and more after the analysis was initially developed. So these containers, they're available on HPC Grid. And we, when you start the Workbench instance, you can pick and use one of those. And you can also view the contents of those in the um, Posit Package Manager. And we release um, maybe a container every half a year after it goes through the vigorous testing. Then going back, we use the Workbench and we use Cloud for day-to-day -day work and training. And then we use Posit Connect for sharing the results of our work. And this is the infrastructure that allows our programmers to perform the analysis they need from start to finish. And as I mentioned earlier, IT supports all of these tools and the SWAT team works with IT to define best practices to communicate uh, our needs and the needs of our community. And we have regular check-ins to address any questions and concerns regarding the infrastructure the relationships that we establish with IT colleagues help us to support our, our community because we are the bridge between IT and uh, the end user, the programmer. And this pretty much covers the infrastructure aspect and how we um, uh, and what we have at Pfizer in terms of the IT infrastructure for R. And now that we discuss this most fundamental level of our hierarchy, let's move on to the next tier. In Maslow's hierarchy, the second tier belongs to safety needs. People want to experience order, predictability, and control in their life. Same comes for when we adopt a new tool. We already discussed how essential it is having a reliable IT infrastructure, but we also need to make sure our colleagues feel secure and safe when it comes to working with R and using the infrastructure we established. So how do we do that? The tier of our hierarchy of needs that corresponds with safety needs is covered by proper documentation and training that we developed. Experienced R programmers will know how to access Workbench and deploy the Shiny app. But what if you're a beginner R programmer and you don't know anything about R? How, how do you know if tool is working properly? This is where documentation and training come into place and provide safety net. If you know what to expect from the tool, then you can assess if it's working properly. So let's talk about the documentation first. Having a uniform advice and guidance for colleagues, especially those new to R, is crucial. So we as a team took it upon ourselves to establish a single source of documentation that's available to all our colleagues worldwide, and then they can access at any time. At Pfizer, we have the internal knowledge website that we customize for our needs. So we chose Confluence as our platform. Confluence is the tool provided by Atlassian. If you might have heard of Atlassian, if you ever use Jira, this is one of their other products. So this is essentially a team workspace that consists of dynamic pages and different spaces. And we have the R and Pfizer space that consists of numerous pages that are organized by topic. In the R and Pfizer space, we publish numerous articles, guides, and other pieces of important documentation to promote and share the best practices with our colleagues. The rule of thumb is if we get the same question from our colleagues more than once, this indicates that we need to write a knowledge article on it um, and then post it to Confluence. By supporting and promoting Confluence, we accompl accomplish a couple of things. So first, we're saving time in the long run by 
gathering all the information in one place and uh, pointing colleagues towards it. And then second, by making sure everyone gets the same uniform advice that our team uh, agreed on. So the question you see on the slide used to be asked at least once a week. Like now that we have this article, this solved the problem and this uh, link guest passed, um, you know, through all of the community by colleagues. And um, documentation that we publish on Confluence, it varies in topics. To name a few examples, for example, the recent articles include the use of REN uh, package for R and R E N B, I should say. I, I don't know why I call it REN <laughs> for our project. Or we made a set of articles on efficient R programming and good practice, um, or using R environment file and so on and so forth. So a lot of different topics. So this pretty much covers the documentation. So now let me tell you more about the training. Over the years, we had a variety of training sessions on various topics from experience our programmers provided for our internal R community. The trainers were either experts from Posit or within Pfizer, and all sessions varied in scope and in expertise level. We conducted sessions to help beginners get started with R. We also recorded like short videos that can be viewed as tips and tricks in addition to the beginner training. There's also more in depth uh, in depth in um, intermediate level training. We have getting started with shiny series. Mastering the tidyverse training is another series of sessions where we dive in into tidyverse packages. And some of these sessions are show and tell and others are hands-on workshops. And speaking of hands-on workshops, we all know that um, the important training aspect is learning programming by doing so we created a series of hands-on um, exercises where programmers can get their hands dirty. So we have 13 mini projects that will be open source this year. Uh, we're planning on doing so. So each project is um, R Markdown file covering, covering a dedicated topic. It can be creating a function, visualizing data, and these exercises are relevant to programmers in clinical research. So trainees can access and perform exercises at their own time, at their own pace, and uh, complete the challenges at the end of each exercise. And all these training sessions, with exception of uh, our short videos, were live sessions that were recorded and posted later to the internal SharePoint website so that new and existing employees can visit, revisit those trainings, um, training sessions at any time. We also noticed that this might be challenging for new R users to go through the trainings if the environment is not properly set up or the context is, context is not relevant or too hard for certain level of R users. This means that we need to help our coworkers navigate the content and listen to the feedback for our trainings this year, we started utilizing Posit Cloud. This is a great solution for us since we have a lot of trainees and they're all at different levels. And with the cloud, trainers can have different sessions with pre-configured training environments. So uh, trainers can install and load all the packages that are needed prior to the training. And this ensures that when employee, um, that everyone, when colleagues get access to the exercise, they also get access to the same environment, to the same set of packages and their versions. So it streamlines the process of actual training and reduces the troubleshooting time. And training is a very broad topic, but I think I gave you the general idea of how we approach it. So now let's go back to our pyramid and uh, look at the next tier. The third tier in Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the loneliness and love needs. So people are social creatures. We need interpersonal relationships. We want to feel connected with other human beings and be part of a group. Uh, and in our, our adoption journey, this translates into creating channels for community support and inclusivity. Learning new technologies and adapting to the new ways of working is incredibly hard. Therefore, it is crucial to connect with, pe with people and give resources to support each other so that when colleagues hit the bottom of the learning pit, they have someone out there to help them to get out of it. 
One of the tools that help us to accomplish this goal is our Pfizer Microsoft Teams channel. It comprises over 1,100 of our users, and anyone at Pfizer can join this channel. This is an incredible resource for community engagement. We have several channels under the R and Pfizer Teams umbrella, such as general, R and Pharma, R questions and answers, training resources, et cetera. Uh, and these channels under this R and Pfizer Team umbrella, um, there we post news, announcements, latest updates, but more importantly, this is a platform where our colleagues seek and get help. When you're battling the programming issue, it might seem that you're the only one in the world facing the problem. And if you spend too much time on it without any help, it might get very lonely and frustrating real quick. But I assure you, there are always someone out there um, who either knows the answer to your question and can help you right away, or who has the same question and you can join the forces together and look for the solution together. So we, therefore, we encourage colleagues to ask questions out there in the open because by asking your questions on Microsoft Teams channel, our colleagues helping themselves, they're getting closer to solving their issue that blocks them. And once they build some R expertise, they can help others by answering their questions. And our main goal as community builders is to help colleagues be more comfortable, not only asking, but also answering each other questions, because this is the way we found the community becomes sustainable. Prior to this channel being established, our colleagues were seeking help within their own reach, asking the colleagues they knew were good at R or asking the internet. Microsoft Teams channel gave colleagues access to R and Pfizer community to other colleagues that face similar problems, working in the same company, following the same standards, procedures, and policies. Googling the question is great, we all know that, but if you're very new to R, you might not even know like what to Google and what tools are available, what packages are available. And when introducing me to the channel, when I first started, started my manager, Mike Smith, once told me the story about one colleague in stat programming group in California, asked if anyone knew how to connect to our Oracle database. And a colleague from global supply organization in other part of the world in Ireland, so it's like half of the world, um, came across this problem earlier, solved it, and then responded, suggesting using appropriate library. So this answer helped the um, US colleague solve the problem pretty quick. And this is just one of the examples of how community supports itself. Now we have tens, if not hundreds of uh, examples like these. This is just one of them. Another great initiative that we run to support the community engagement is the book club. So back in early 2023, our team decided to initiate a book club. And for our book club, we, surprise, surprise, picked the R for Data Science second edition book. It, because we thought it gives the most comprehensive overview and is suitable for beginners. In order to initiate the book club, we made a sign up form. Um, it was like a Microsoft form and it was pretty short and included questions like, do you have any experience with the book? What is your role and location? We also asked quest, uh, colleagues um, the question to assess their level of R. Usually it is very hard for programmers to assess themselves, especially if they're given options like beginner, intermediate, and advanced. advanced, Because it all depends on who you take as a reference. Do you take your colleague as a reference or Hadley Wickham? So this is the question where we provided a little bit more examples. Uh, so colleagues can choose from and have, um, answer options like, I don't have any experience with R, or I can write simple code, but I need help. I am familiar with my major packages, um, or I have enough experience to write my own packages. So stuff like this. And this information from the sign up form uh, would have given us comprehensive overview of the book club attendees and give us enough information to organize the book club. So once the form was ready, we posted the announcement on Microsoft Teams encouraging to fill out the forms, those who wanted to sign up for the book club. And we also used like a lot of other platforms. We announced it during the calls where our users were present. We also used emails and various distribution lists to reach colleagues. And all in all, we had around 132 colleagues who signed up and we aimed to have seven to 11 colleagues per group. 
So we divided colleagues into 14 study groups. And the geography spanned from North America through Europe to Asia. And in some cases, the group assignments were obvious. For example, we had six people sign up from Europe and eight from Philippines. So, you know, here's your group. However, the countries like US, where we had 80 people sign up, we made the effort to compose the groups in the same time zone and make sure that each group had beginners and experts um, or I should say more advanced our developers together because we wanted colleagues with different level of expertise on the same team. Once the teams were composed, we contacted the regional groups asking who would like to volunteer and become group lead. And we got pretty good response rate uh, for folks who wanted to become team leads. And once we identify the group leads, we scheduled the meetings for appropriate time zones and led the kickoff meetings. At the kickoff meetings, we provided like all the support materials we could. And we made it very clear that we didn't want the group leads to have additional burden, like overhead uh, to, um, to their day-to-day -day job. So we distributed as much helpful information we could. And at this point, uh, the group leads were free to organize their own meeting with their own schedule, communicate with their group members, and set the meetings the way it worked best for them. After about a few months later, we came back and distributed the feedback survey to see how the things were going. And we received about 50% response rate. And as you can get, guess, the majority of respond, uh, responders were colleagues who made the effort to like stick with attending the sessions because it is hard to do that um, like every week. Uh, so, however, a few indicated that they have stopped attending the sessions. Throughout the month of working on this initiatives and leading one of the groups, I saw colleagues like leaving and joining groups and join and uh, groups joining forces together. And some groups were meeting every other week, some groups were meeting every week. And the biggest obstacle for this initiative is that um, colleagues indicated in the survey were day-to-day -day job commitments and schedule conflict. Uh, so that date, when day-to-day -day job commitments increase, it become harder to attend sessions and read the book on a scheduled basis. One colleague wrote in their survey, my lack of attendance is not a reflection of the colleagues who worked hard to put this together and facilitate the sessions. I simply didn't have enough time to actively participate and had to stop attending altogether. And another colleague wrote, I'd say my session are going great. They're organic, and I think it's nice to give the group some freedom to customize according to the group preferences. So some groups are still going through the book together because of the schedule they picked, and some have finished. And overall, we received a positive feedback, um, and some colleagues expressed willingness to join other group, group uh, the, sorry, <laughs> book clubs in the future. And as a result, the two teams uh, proceeded to read the Mastering Shiny book club after that. So we have two groups doing that right now. So this is the story of the book club advisor and it continues. Moving on, the other things we're doing for community support is keeping our internal community informed and engaged with what's happening in broader external our community. For instance, if my uh, SWAT team colleagues and I visit the external conference, we will always present the highlights of the conferences and make summary of latest and greatest and most useful developments that we think are valuable for Pfizer right now. But we don't go to the conferences monthly, although I wish. Uh, but every month or every other month, we release the advances in our newsletter that is highlighting latest and greatest in the R community and tools and events. And this keeps um, our colleagues informed all year long. And since the beginning of the year, we also invited our community leaders to present for our internal our community. This year, we had Rich Yanyon presenting on the open source collaboration and GT package progress in January. And in a few days on Monday, we're going to welcome Hadley Wickham presentation. And we're super excited about it. So now that we discuss all these initiatives for community engagement and support, it's time to go back to our pyramid and see what the next layer is. The next tier in Maslow's hierarchy is esteem needs. This includes the feeling of accomplishment and respect. Esteem presents the typical human desire to be accepted and valued by others. 
in the R adoption community building pyramid, it translates into showcasing your work. When your colleagues are getting more comfortable with programming in R, they start being involved in R projects and they're eager to show the results of their work in hopes that it will help others and showcase the hard work they did. In order to establish proper channel through which colleagues can showcase their work, we created the Community of Practice and it became a very successful initiative. Community of Practice is one hour monthly meeting that consists of two 20 minute presentations, usually followed by 10 minutes of questions. The presentations vary in topics and our expertise level to keep all colleagues engaged. And the presentations are recorded and we upload all these recording from the event to the corresponding SharePoint website to make sure they are accessible for colleagues, for uh, new employees and for colleagues who didn't, um, who missed the sessions and didn't have a chance to attend one. Since mid 2022, we held 17 sessions in various presentations. So to name a few, on the topic of packages, we had a great presentation called The Wonders of the Point Blank Package. Um, what There was one presentation on lessons learned, like our bad habits. And there even been like broader topics about the learning journey. One person presented on navigating the R landscape with the help of our center of excellence. So they were sharing their learning journey during the community of practice. These meetings reveal the opportunity for growth for our colleagues who are just starting their our journey. Uh, they, the, the, the colleagues, they're presented with various ways they can advance uh, in their learning when they see their peers' presentations. We learned that colleagues love to share uh, the results of their work and that these meetings help us to connect colleagues with each other that wouldn't otherwise meet. And showcasing the work is also a great avenue to receiving feedback from the broader audience and hear the questions that audience might have regarding your projects or your coding solutions. So now that we talked about showcasing, let's move on to the last and final tier of the pyramid. The tip of the iceberg in Maslow's pyramid is need of self-actualization. This refers to the realization of a person's potential, need of self-fulfillment and personal growth. So put this into perspective, uh, maybe you've been in this situation where you found a new hobby, let's say drawing. And at first you needed a little push or maybe a lot of help when you first started. But as time has passed, you started to feel more comfortable and then the things that needed a lot of effort first became easier or even second nature with every step you took. And then you became better at it. You became much better at it. You even started asking yourself a lot of what if questions. You became more comfortable with experimenting and started noticing how certain things could be improved and maybe you created something new and beautiful like this painting. So in our adoption and community building journey, this is the tier of the pyramid where our colleagues sharing their ideas and giving back to the community. This is where they become more comfortable with their R uh, skills. They become more confident and creative in their own code. This is the tier where they have everything in their own hands and they try to improve the world around them and also inspire others. At this level, a lot of push should come from colleagues themselves, but we do provide some avenues for channeling this energy. First, we host our advisor hangout event that happens every other Wednesday and anyone advisor interested in programming can join. So this, um, we adopted this format, the data science hangout format from POSIT led by Rachel Dempsey. The POSIT events, if you haven't uh, joined one. It happens every Thursday at Moon ESD, and I encourage you to join once in a while. And anyone from the data community can join. So similarly at Pfizer, during our own internal event, we invite a colleague, uh, we call the colleague a featured guest, to talk about their R journey, what excites them about R, what they're working on. These meetings are not recorded and all questions are audience-led. And this is a great opportunity to share your story and connect with fellow programmers. This is where colleagues can inspire each other, share lessons learned, and talk about what made them the programmers they are. We started Hangouts in 2023 and already conducted 19 sessions. 
And if you want to set up Hangouts, for example, at your own company, I'd suggest scheduling guests in advance and learning a little bit more about colleagues you invite prior to the session. This is not the easiest initiative to run since the audience might be a bit shy at times asking questions. However, you know, once your community grows, people know more each other, uh, they become more comfortable with asking questions and sharing their stories. And the sessions are not recorded, so this always helps. Another more technical route for idea sharing and inspiring others and giving back is to become a part of the external working group and get involved into the open source development. At Pfizer, we have colleagues who are involved in various R related external working groups. We have a monthly meetings where we connect with these colleagues and we share the ideas, we discuss industry developments with each other and see what we can and should internalize at Pfizer. As part of this initiative, we also distribute external working groups newsletter to keep broader Pfizer, our community informed and engaged. And here we are, we got to the top of our, our adoption community building hierarchy of needs. And now in conclusion, I'd like to say that adopting new language and building the community is like putting the puzzle pieces together. It is hard, it is time consuming. And at the same time, it's very rewarding because with the right approach, you can see the progress. The initiatives we set up at Pfizer are not set in stone. They grow and they change and our community uh, changes with it and the community needs change. But one of the most important um, things in our journey is to be agile. So listen to the feedback. And at the same time, we try to be laser focused on what's important in the long run for us. We are focused on supporting, enabling, energizing our, our community because engaged community solves business problems faster and more efficient way. It supports innovation, knowledge sharing, collaboration, and create supporting learning environment. And if you're just starting your adoption and community building journey or thinking of one, remember to be patient. Our team is trying out different formats to keep our community advisor engaged and fulfill our pyramid of needs. Some initiatives get traction right away. Others take time to get on track, but this is all part of the journey for us. And we know that being persistent and consistent and listening to our community's feedback is key to figuring out what works best for the organization. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, okay, I see one question, one open question. Are people from our squad 100% dedicated to build this RCOE? Yes, we're 100% dedicated resource uh, for RCOE. Um, same questions for the R learners. Are they encouraged? Oh, sorry, questions are moving. Are they encouraged by their line managers to attend the training sessions and to test our implementation in their daily routines. This seems critical to me, achieve my, any change management. This is a great question uh, because, because we did have, especially like in our book club survey, um, some of the feedback was kind of, uh, you know, my managers were very encouraging and others had like troubles to find um, time in, in their day-to-day -day tasks um, for our engagement. So I think it very much, since Pfizer is such a huge organization, it very much depends on what department you're on, what manager you have, what projects you're working on. There are definitely people who are trying to like get ahead of the curve and learn R, even if they don't have any R projects. Um, on the other hand, there are people who actively involved in the art projects and their manage their people who are managing them actually creating art trainings as well. So of course they're kind of like more in the loop for training. So um, I totally agree that 
um, management plays a big role um, in how much time you can spend on it. Do you use any menu front ends for R, like blue sky statistics? Oh, sorry, the questions are moving. I am not aware of those. The only front end for R I use is Shiny, if that's, <laughs> if you can consider this a front end, I don't think so. But yeah, I don't, uh, maybe in other parts of our organization, but I don't think I know any of these. I'm sorry, Bob. Um, one in, sorry, I don't know the name, but there is a question, is R the only major programming language advisor? What was the situation before this initiative? So no, R is not the only major programming language advisor. People use variety of languages advisor. It's probably so many languages, like even more languages that we know. SAS is very prevalent language advisor. Uh, people use R, people use Python. Um, you know, people in IT might use so many other languages. The situation before this initiative was that I could only speak for R is that uh, people were using R, but it wasn't the initiative where they could connect with each other. And now we're trying to connect our users specifically so that they can get the support and help. Um, I think that answers the question. FK asked, can you tell more about the start of the R adoption? Start of the, okay. What is the top down or more bottom up to design this hierarchy? How can I inspire my company from the bottom? This is a great question. This is a very loaded question. So to speak from my perspective, the R adoption started before I joined Pfizer. I think I was one of the um, results of the R adoption. And um, I, there was definitely um, push from the management. So I, I started the, uh, I, I shared the story about how Mike Smith um, and Douglas Robinson, sorry, I'm like trying to go through the slides and show it to you. Uh, started this initiative. So they were the real kind of push for starting the RCOE. And they definitely got, um, let me reshare this. There you go. And they definitely got the men, they showed the value and they definitely got the um, managers so-called buy-in and happening what's happening seeing what's happening within the broader uh our push in pharma and what other companies are doing was definitely part of it and then um they also as leaders had some prior experiences with creating similar teams so um this is how the r adoption started as and as a result and rcoe started as a result i was hired so I can't really speak too much into like what happened before that. Um, but I do agree that it is very hard to inspire my the company from the bottom. What I would say is uh, there are a lot of examples, maybe like this, our consortium webinar, like other our consortium webinars, um, other initiatives, other presentations um, that you can share with the management. And then um, you can show the value of those initiatives. And if you have um, certain projects that can be or should be accomplished with R and they have certain metrics, you can also um, try to like make this kind of like sales pitch of how and why you should transition to R. Um, and our community is uh, very accepting. And I think, um, you know, you can join like data science hangouts. There are multiple Slack channels you can join to see what projects you are able to take on and maybe what open source projects you can adopt at your own company that are using R. And since our community is very receptive, you can ask for advice 
at maybe other art conferences. So I think just like, you know, step by step, um, you might get there. Sorry, it was a long answer, but I hope this helped. What is the biggest challenge you all faced in determining the IT requirements and getting buy-in from your IT department? This is a great question. I am very lucky to join the company where I just had access to Posit Workbench, Posit Cloud. It was all handled before I started. My job is to make sure um, I communicate with IT department. I see latest and greatest. I ask them about the features and you know how it can be like implemented and um, write Confluence articles, help users to organize it um, in their heads. But yeah, I don't think I can speak to a bigger picture, unfortunately, um, of how this infrastructure like was set up in the first place. How to join the R and Pfizer Microsoft Teams channel? Great question. So step one, join Pfizer. Step two, um, shoot me a message in Teams and I'll add you to the Teams channel. Otherwise, unfortunately, it's not open to the public. However, there are great channels that are open to the public. So you can always join the R for Data Science Slack community, um, learning community. This is this could be a great alternative if you do not work at Pfizer. How do your R users interact with other languages, Python, SAS? Do you have a undefined platform where all languages can coexist? So depending on which language you use, you would use like appropriate ID, I believe. Um, I'm not a SAS users, but user, but you would use SAS Studio um, for SAS. I uh, if you are R user and your Python user, like you can either pick your ID or if you're working in in the multilingual uh, team, you can also use, let's say, Orto if part of your team work in Python and part of your team work in SAS, or you can use packages like Reticulate. Uh, but I think SAS users have their own SAS Studio platform they use. Um, I don't think uh, we have the unified platform unless I'm not aware of one. Okay, I do, um, sorry, let me see. thank you. What are the future milestones our advisor regarding the R adoption? Uh, that's a good question. I, um, I don't know actually like how much you can talk about it, but to hint is that um, our colleagues are involved into the various um, our external working groups. And some of them are, uh, for example, our submission working group is a great group for pilots. Some of them are completed, some of them on the way. It's all out in the open, it's all in GitHub. And we think it's a great, um, you know, great effort and something to look into more closely and see how it can fit with Pfizer needs. Oh, and I do have, I wanna add to the previous like infrastructure question. Um, so I got to note that our previous R environment was managed by business lines rather than IT org. And it was, a little bit messy. Um, and then we managed to persuade the IT org and business lines that having a professional environment would allow business to do the work rather than manage the environments. So this this was our approach. So it's you know time and money saving in the long run. My impression is that users have R downloaded directly on their system. Are they allowed to install their own R packages? Um, so this is a great question. 
We as SWAT team, we as RCO, we strongly, strongly, strongly encourage our uh, colleagues to use our workbench because this environment is well controlled because you, you can reproduce your results um, and it's available, it's out there. Uh, however, we do have opportunity for people I shouldn't say opportunity, I should say possibility for people to download the art studio through our you know, internal digital um, website, and they do do so. However, whatever they install on their own machine, we're not responsible um, for. So you cannot do, the message is that you cannot do any work, production work or any work that would be looked at someone rather than you, other than you, like you can't do this on desktop. All the things you can do on your desktop are sandbox, playground, um, doing something, you know, like small projects, but nothing major that is considered to be production work. How do you decide which R packages can be allowed in your containers? What testing is needed? There is a set of tests that we wrote uh, a while back. Well, when I say we, um, I should really uh, say Mike. Um, and this is like his question, his like expertise rather. Um, so the the packages that can be allowed those are usually the ones that are well documented well tested packages on their own that we trust and then we also do like the the um the testing on top so i would say if your pack like if if this is like a random package on github we would need to look into it but if this is dplyr then you know it it's it's going to be allowed into container i hope that answers the question Uh, okay, Bob provided the link for a similar talk. Um, that would be great if I could copy the uh, link and look at the talk. So thank you, Bob. What is the size of Pfizer RCOE team? So the CO team comprises of SWAT team, and SWAT team is like six people. And the um, the core team, um, it was around like eight to ten people, but it is a little bit fluid uh, because th there are certain changes that can happen. For example, people get um, more workload and they are not able to participate maybe this particular quarter, and then they can hand off like some of their um some of the tasks that they were doing to other colleagues or their new colleagues that are joining Pfizer or were at Pfizer but really want to participate in a uh, core team so th this is a little bit fluid but i would say core team comprises maybe like around 10 people but the core team um are not kind of like full time r people uh, as opposed to swat team So how do you monitor the progress of practices and the adoption of this new language? This is, um, this is one of the hard things, I guess, to monitor. So we only can go so far in monitoring as a team. So for example, when we were performing, like when we were doing the um, mini projects, uh, we kind of, focused on mini projects and completion of mini projects for our um, department, maybe like for one semester. And we made an effort to uh, schedule the calls where we go through the mini projects. We had the system of like buddies that were kind of more experienced. Our programmers were assigned to people who were going through the projects. 
And then as we progress, we ask people to submit their finished media projects. Um, so this was kind of like the monitoring of the product progress back then. But now that we have a cloud, this can be streamlined because cloud provides you with the capabilities. So this is this is around the training. Um, for the book club, I think I um, addressed some of that when I was talking about the feedback. This is one of the like also hard um, initiative to monitor because um, it's also like spans across the globe and sometimes people, um, you know, 50% response rate is good, but um, it's sometimes it's hard to get uh, people's feedback. Uh, but all in all, I think new projects that are like starting in R or the amount of people who come for the consults for our SWAT team with their R projects is also one indi uh, indicator. Um, there's also um, like there were a few tools that were adopted from, from the open source into Pfizer. So I think this is a good indication of the initiative going well and people exploring new tools and started using odd tools in their day-to-day -day job. How many packages for submission apps you have in the container? Well, we do have a lot of containers. Um, I don't even, I'm not sure even how many, at least, and um, over the years, I can't like, I don't want to pull up the board and stuff, but uh, each container can comprise, I don't know. Um, oh, I just received a little note that we have 1500 plus packages in the container. So somebody ran metrics real quick. So here you go, 1500 plus packages. For submission purpose, working on SDM, Atom, and TLF, who validates the packages that will uh, be used, such as Admiral? That's a great question. We have like a separate group who handles the Admiral package. We actually have one group that developed like one of the Admiral packages, like the extensions. Um, who validates the packages? Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I can pinpoint who exactly does that because I unfortunately I wasn't like at that, you know, over there working on this. So pass. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was I was thinking it's like somebody within Pfizer or outside Pfizer. This is very well tested and documented package, but yeah, the validation question, like I was trying to dodge the bullet. <laughs> What are the biggest challenges you have faced internally and externally at Pfizer to gain traction for our adoption? Well, it's a, it's also a very loaded question. Um, I think in the times of change, when um, industry is like has done something for like 10, 20 plus years or use certain language, and uh, there are a lot of people who are like great developers in this particular language. Um, and then now the industry is like moving towards this new and exciting and shiny things thing. And the, the R and I guess shiny changes so fast and the capabilities like they, like they change so fast, so quickly. Um, and especially in big companies, they might move a little bit less than quick. Um, this is one of the biggest challenges, I guess, to get like maybe everyone on board with this. Uh, but so far, I think our management was very receptive to change towards R. So I think this is great. Um, however, it's always important to remember that when people are working on uh, certain projects, they have certain deadlines and deliverables. It is very hard to start learning new thing and like simultaneously plug in 
those like new knowledge into the things you're working towards. Um, so I guess the overall like um, business and commitments to certain projects um, also can be an obstacle, but I think it will uh, change pretty soon. Oh, and the one thing I kind of like, I, on back of my mind, I was thinking about validation. One thing also um, worth plugging in here is that our validation hub initiative, like overall initiative, uh, specifically, I think our package repository initiative that is kind of like started last year. Um, I think it's a great initiative when it comes to like our validation in general. So yeah, just wanted to make this plug. So I'm not dodging the bullet this question like completely. Do you have any tips for reducing friction for the adoption of R for new packages? For example, Tidyverse can be scary to our users who started before R3. Okay. So <laughs> this this is an interesting question because like there's this debate of like when you're a new R user, should you just start from base R or just start using Tidyverse, and uh, this is one of our, our hand, hangout questions um, regarding this, like, when do you, when you start teaching R or learning R, um, when do you, what do you do, do you do base R or Tidyverse? Um, so when we talk about the actual, like, Tidyverse um, and adoption of R, I think it has a little lower, maybe like entry point to study Tidyverse just because of how much great literature I came across when actually like doing the book lab, even R for data science book, it starts with like, it, it is very, very beginner friendly and it has great exercises and it has great community online. Even if none of your coworkers are doing R, you can just go to the online community. And there are certain GitHub repositories that have the um, exercises solved and explained how they were solved. So I think the, just like building the community support will help to reduce the, this friction maybe of our adoptions that you are talking about. Because knowing that you are not alone, having calls to ask questions, um, you know, watching those YouTube videos, just like having all this infrastructure in place is very helpful and pointing colleagues to the right resources and uh, right books, I think would be helpful. Hope that helps. In which fields does Pfizer use R? Clinical trial, marketing, finance, are the R user groups cross topic? Yes, I. Um, so I know they use it in supply chain. They do use it in finance, or I should say, they might use it in finance. I'm sure there are like pockets of Pfizer that I'm not aware that are using R. Um, I I know that. People at Pfizer even use Julia, and I never met those people. And I'm not sure what they're using Julia for, but they do use Julia. So I'm sure R is used like across variety. We do have questions, like when we get questions um, in our, you know, in Microsoft Teams, they're coming from like all different parts of organizations. They're coming from pharmacometrics. They coming from um, People, like I mentioned, supply chain from statistics and data sciences department. It's just big variety of people. I Since Pfizer has like 70,000 people, I might not even know all of these people. And I have to like look at their little bubbles to see what departments they're working on. And they also, this is also used in like early clinical development. So yeah, R is used in a lot of different departments. What are you excited about for the future of our community at Pfizer? So I'm excited for it to grow actually. 
like I think we can do better. Eleven hundred, I think we can do twelve, like you know, twelve, twenty-one, thirty-one hundred. I'm I'm down for it to grow, and I really want people to get comfortable with like um as I said during the presentation, like more not only answering like asking but answering questions. So I'm excited to grow this community. I really want people to connect uh, with each other, especially on different projects and different topics. Um, I'm really excited about adopting new tools. Um, there are great developments in the open source community that are very worth uh, to look at um, and maybe potentially working on the projects that we can open source and you know show the the world that we're working on. Okay, I have this uh, business or IT. I don't think it's a question, but I choose, no, I'm just kidding. I don't know, it's probably someone's uh, comment about something. Have you been able to quantively demonstrate the R adoption benefits for Pfizer revenue, market segmentation, et cetera? Great question, Anonymous, that's indeed. I was like saving it for the end because it's a tough one. So as we all know, quantitative benefits are very hard to measure. Um, and I've I've tried to do that in some of my, you know, previous, um, working on some previous projects, like I was trying to like calculate the amount of time I spend on certain things and then the amount of time it would have taken, taken, um, for example, medical monitor to do that. And then like, you know, trying to figure out who, gets paid what and like how much money the company will save. So it is it is very hard. One thing um, we can do is um, we can see what processes we automate um, and then see how much time it actually, like I said, took that department. Like if it takes you a couple of hours uh, um, a year, maybe it's not worth it, but if somebody's spending like two hours uh, oh, a week or a day on certain report, and then you can just do it with one click or do the automation completely, then it definitely saves time. So what we do, we uh, make sure we document all our kind of like accomplishments and all projects that we as a team worked on. And then we can um, give it to managers and managers of our managers. And some of them um, can have quantitative um, demonstration some of them only like qualitative for now, but we're in our early steps, early journey. So yeah, I leave it at that. <laughs> Anonymous attendee said, I switched from Tidyverse to data table last year and I will never look back. <laughs> Good for you, Anonymous attendee. Good for you. <laughs> There's no open questions. Can't see any. <laughs> 